Hello everyone, an evening if you're in one of our time zones, and if you're not, well, good morning, afternoon, wherever you may be. We're ready to talk about some science, and I might want to mute my own stream for this because I'm getting yeah, a that's what 10 I had second delay well. audio. There we go. Much nicer. And I'm sorry. It's sorry, not I'm a hurry. stream unless there's some problem with audio. And I'm sorry if the stream heard that from both of us because <laughs> we both did the same error. <laughs> Ah, uh, they wouldn't have heard it on mine, hopefully. Um, hopefully. But we can, we can I, I did. <laughs> Stumped me up. Because, yes, that's how we always have to start streams. Uh, there's always it's difficulties. <laughs> we'll, we'll just give everyone a warning. We're sorry. <laughs> warning. I Well, I am definitely educated beyond my intelligence, as yeah. I have said before. And we'll happily say again. It has a nice ring to it, which is it, weird. It does. I, I love a nice it. Thing. <laughs> It's my favourite saying of yours. It's not educated beyond my intelligence. <laughs> it's certainly how <laughs> Although, I feel. <laughs> yes. Though who, were, who weren't educated beyond their intelligence are the subjects of tonight's video. Oh, We have yeah. got found some people who, whose intelligence surpassed their education and have bettered the world for everyone. But they're Aussies. Yep. Which is why we're talking about it. Yeah, because we're pretty sure a lot of you lot out there in America land and Pommy land and wherever else in the world you are that isn't this lovely land of Australia um, that you all think is fake, um, <laughs> you probably or haven't heard of most of these people. Although some of them you may have because uh, 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 I don't know if we're actually covering any that are super well known. Oh, maybe one. Maybe one of them would be well enough known. I imagine the Braggs would be. They, they, We're about they to find said, out, aren't we? So. I mean, anyone who's done physics would have heard of them because they, what they've done is quite common. So, so yes, so, here we was go with William the, Bragg. William Bragg. Yes. So, just in case people were not sure, what we're doing tonight is we're going through a number of different... Um, Aussie scientists and their contributions. Now, we want to start with Lawrence Bragg for the, well, and his father, I believe was Will. Yeah, oh, yeah, so William Lawrence Bragg, and then you had his father. What was his father's name? Um, um, yeah. Son oh, William Henry. <laughs> William, William Henry Bragg, yeah. <laughs> for anyone who's so wondering, William Henry Matt and I can't and remember William all Lawrence. of this entirely, so we actually do have cue cards in front of us. <laughs> Thank you, Wikipedia yes. and various other sources. <laughs> Yes, but it is confusing because his father was Sir William Henry Bragg, Bragg. and he was Sir, Sir William, William Lawrence, Lawrence Bragg. Bragg. <laughs> yeah. But they actually won the um, Nobel Prize for X-ray crystallography. I'll get to that in a moment. And they did it as a father and son team. They got it 50-50. But the father was born in England, so we won't dwell too much on him. But the son, Lawrence Bragg, you know, Will Lawrence Bragg, Which, his picture was we have up there born in... <laughs> yes the one we have there well it was born in australia and he is one of the founding fathers of crystallography which is a massive area of science because it tells us what the structure of crystals are hence you know, crystallography it's about so it tells you where atoms are placed and what they look like so when they say sodium chloride looks like this or a ruby crystal looks like this with other deformations or when they eventually got to figuring out what dna looks like it was all to do with the um pioneering work from the brags so what they eventually sh what, what what they actually showed was that if you take x-rays and fire them through the sample the x-rays will interact with the structure of the crystal that you've got and by crystal i don't mean some like little quartz thing that somebody is yeah. trying to sell yeah, to you. If you're a follower of your... spirit science, just forget it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm not talking about that kind of crystal, like not the one that's going to help fix your cracked aura for $300. <laughs> no, I'm just talking about <laughs> anything that has a repeating structure. Yeah. Basically. Well, so which sodium is a lot chloride. of stuff. Yeah, well, most metals yeah. are, are actually crystalline. I actually, I can get it in a moment. I actually have um, a ruby crystal that I made in first year as part of oh, a wow. research group. Cool. And we, we did we did actually do some crystallography on it. We put it through um, an XRD, X-ray diffraction, or X-ray crystallography machine because the, the uni has one, which is 
very similar to what these guys were doing, except they did it back in the day where you didn't have computers to do it. So what they did is they had an X-ray source. They fired it through, I believe sodium chloride was the first one they did. I'll see if I can find a picture of one of the original, like actual photos they got. Um, then where all of the X-rays bounce to based on how the crystal was arranged, that bounce and they give you weird patterns on the back. And this and is back in the day before cool they maps. realized how dangerous x-rays were. So they were all standing in the room watching these things. <laughs> yes, with <laughs> often very limited protection, which is probably yeah. what got Rosalind Franklin in the end. Um, yeah. um, I don't not believe Rosen's. Um, Lawrence's father also died from cancer as well, I think. so. Yeah. So, um, uh, probably related to the work that they did with um, x-rays. Yeah, and... But what it did show was that you can use this to figure out what things look like. And you might be thinking, you know, what can we do with that? Yeah, we know what maybe salt looks like. But yeah. you can take this well beyond that. You can figure out what proteins look like, what um, viruses look like. This is actually the technique they use to figure out what AIDS was and how one of its proteins works. And that allowed us to develop the, one of the world's first targeted drugs where we developed the drug specifically because we knew what we were doing with it. Whereas most others have just been found through like kind of trial and error or a mix of like half educated trial and error. And, but one of the AIDS treatments, which actually meant that it wasn't a lethal disease anymore, if you can get access to it, was actually developed using, um, well, in part crystallography. It's never one thing in science. It's always lots of things that go together. Sorry, I'm still trying to find this. Uh, I should find this different. Well, I mean, in the an interesting thing about him is, uh, I mean, he was director of the Cavendish Laboratory in Cambridge when um, the discovery of structure of DNA was done by um, Watson and Crick. So, uh, and when you consider the um, the techniques that Lawrence and his dad came up with for using um, X ray crystallography, yeah, I've said that wrong. <laughs> Um, would have been used in the discovery of um, the structure of DNA. And I'm going to complain about this Wikipedia article because you, I don't think you should list Watson and Crick without... Uh, and I, I hate myself for this because I've forgotten her name, the woman who was also... Rosalind involved. Franklin. Thank you, Rosalind. Which you, who you mentioned earlier because of her exposure to x-rays because of this exact same yes. thing. <laughs> Also, I have a example of a diffraction pattern. I don't believe this is sodium chloride. It doesn't look like sodium chloride to me. But um, if Jen, you can put it up, uh, people can see what I'm talking about. So oh, what, what you would do at? is it, it's an x-ray. Oh, you're taking there we go. An x -ray, yeah, you're taking an x-ray of a crystal. But see how you get all these weird patterns? Those patterns... Um, yeah. They when you do see, what's yeah. known as a reverse Fourier tra or Fourier transform or reverse Fourier transform, depending on which way you go, you can go from what structure it took to give you that pattern or go from the pattern back to what the structure actually is. And so what these guys did, they did it with sodium chloride and actually showed what the crystal structure was, which included like the spacings of the atoms. They actually figured out where all the nuclei were sitting comparable to each other which was an incredibly powerful tool. Yes, at the time, you can argue, you know, what, what's it like to know sodium chloride? But when you can actually figure out what everything around you looks like on a tiny scale, it's very powerful. And the reason that you need x-rays for this is you can't do it with light. In fact, the, the actual wavelength Well, technically, you are doing it with light, but light. you can't do it with... Yeah, sorry, visible <laughs> light. There we go. You visible can't do it with light, visible yeah. light because the wavelengths are too long. They're actually too big to see atoms. So the actual photons are bigger than the gaps between atoms, whereas X-rays are much, much shorter. They can fit through the gaps. You can also do this with electrons. Um, it was an Australian team that showed that, I don't believe. But they actually... I remember that team demonstrated on what I believe was a nickel crystal... They actually, like, someone accidentally let oxygen into the sample and it oxidized the, the crystal. So they had to anneal it. So they heated the sample um, to get rid of the oxide. And what the heating did, the annealing did, is it rearranged it to give a nice even structure. When they, so when they actually fired electrons at it, it gave yeah. a proper diffraction pattern. So that was like, a, like an accident in the lab that actually meant that the <laughs> experiment worked, which I like. But that's, that's going on a bit from... 
um, brag. So yeah, though, I, I just like it. It's like a father and son team that won a Nobel Prize. It, it's that, amazing how often common. these things happen, though, that uh, because when we're, we're, especially when we're talking about the fact that they developed this technique together, they won a Nobel Prize for it. But their technique then went on to help um, Rosalind Crick and Watson discover um, the structure of DNA because of the the techniques they had from that and that also ended up with the nobel prize and how these things escalate because uh science is like that you come up with a new invention or a new idea and a new way of doing something and that leads to all other new ways of develop of looking at science and looking at yeah. the world so i actually the second video on my channel just cracked two thousand views and i there's a reason i'm bringing this up um i don't actually like the way i presented in that video because in my second one i'm not yeah it was before i got <laughs> practice at things but the topic of that was about x-rays well well x-rays a nuke powered x-ray space lasers but one of the problems there is that x-ray lasers are really hard to make but there is a way to do it and there's a bunch of these places around the world that now make x-ray lasers to do diffraction with because different types of way um x-rays and different you know, beam intensities different wavelengths tell you different yeah. things and australia's got one of them the australian synchrotron um uh, it's it's this it's quite weird because Australia is you know a fairly small country when it comes to like a um, like a financial point of view. But we're not too bad with science, but we actually keep this thing running. It's really useful. Um, it's basically an ex a particle accelerator for electrons in the middle. It's like a circle, and it's got all these branches sticking off it like lines, and they take these really fast electrons, like pass them through the beam, and then they put plates next to it and make the electrons wobble. And whenever you do that to an electron, you end up generating um, electromagnetic waves out of it. And so if you do it the right way, you can get um, X-ray coming out. So you essentially have a whole set of like X-ray lasers that you use for research. And I forget how many beam lines there are, but... Um... <laughs> no, no, this, himself, this is like the size of like, <laughs> this is a massive building. Um, like you wouldn't even fit this on a megalodon. No. <laughs> Which is definitely, definitely extinct. Yeah, but Sorry you can't to burst everyone's bubbles. <laughs> but then again, for a small well. road and all sharks look big. <laughs> yes, although we, we love you, Daddy. We'd probably leave Nerdy al alone because it would just look at a road and be like, that's too small. And the thing is, we know how Megalodon hunted and we know what levels of the water it lived in, which is how we know it's extinct. Because it couldn't, it didn't live at deep levels. It was a shallow water predator that hunted um, uh, s small whales and yeah. other like cetaceans. Um, it was also pretty vicious. We found its teeth in fossil bones of whales. Like, so that's how we know it hunt what it hunted. Um, because it left its evidence behind, including a few where the teeth got lost in the bone and then the whale must have got away, um, and other times where it didn't. But, um, it, yeah, that, that's... I'm not good at getting sidetracked, am I? No, no, you're not good at getting... No, neither of us are. We're, we're really good at staying on topic. <laughs> um, but, yeah, that, um, the, the brags, they're impressive, the... I mean, what they did didn't to get get that Nobel Prize fairly early on in the history of Nobel prizes, really. Yeah, they, it was it was fairly early, and but it was it started an entire field of science. Like this is like, this yes. is what people do their entire PhDs and careers in is in crystallography. Um, I, I've met quite a few really uh, cool people who work in this area. And yeah, all they do is they'll make all these crystal structures and then spend um, the rest of the time figuring out what they look like using this this stuff. Look, well, to be honest, without cannot... some of the work they've done, you wouldn't be doing the work you're doing. Arguably, yes. Yeah, arguably. <laughs> I'll, I'll add arguably there. Yeah, it's but... hard because it's 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 always hard to tell. Yeah, you know, what, what, what would have happened? What. But yeah, I it's. I mean, with some of our understanding of how, how atoms work, uh, even of how we could create lasers, came from this earlier research. So, it is... I mean, the first one, um, the first laser was made using a ruby crystal as well, yep. and it was because we knew a the lot of the electronic the properties. Yep. Um, yeah, I mean, it's hard to tell exactly how much was... Uh, you can still, like, if you have a ruby crystal, it's not too hard to make a laser. Uh, out of it. Crystal. 
<laughs> well, that was the first laser, 1960. Yeah. Yep. I remember that because I just lasers. So there we go, nerdy. If you find me a bunch of rubies, maybe I'll make you some lasers you can put on a shark. Sure. They won't do anything. <laughs> they won't be very powerful. Um, all you need nice. is you need a ruby crystal, a couple of mirrors, or well, you need dielectric mirrors, which are not easy to get your hands on or cheap, um, and a camera flash lamp. That's how they made the first uh, first laser. And, so, and that, a, that a very um, passive shark. <laughs> or oh, you'll never get it on top of the shark without getting. Oh, you suppose you could put the shark to sleep. Yeah. I mean, they tag great whites. I mean, you just tag them with something that has a laser on it. Yeah. Laser tag! <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'll, I'll go back to bed now. <laughs> huh. uh, that's dreadful. Okay, so um, that's the brags, which is one of Matt's favorite ones <laughs> but um we, we've got others one of the ones i can actually talk about yeah because well, so it's part of a few of the syllabus so one of the problems um, we have here you. is um for matt and i <clears throat> very much if it's outside of uh maths and physics we probably don't know terribly much about it unless it's chemistry oh i can do chemistry and, unless it's chemistry but once on it moves side. biology mm, or and, the, medicine. and the problem we've got in australia is most of our, our high out well known ones are in medicine because Australia does really well internationally in medicine. So yeah, medicine um, and biochem um, we do pretty well in. And we, and we, we, we yeah, but we were kind of hoping we'd have Mero here to help us out this week, but um, she had alternative things. But I'm not, so I'm not picking on her at all. <laughs> she couldn't make it, unfortunately. Um, but no. It would have been nice to relied on her a little bit. <laughs> Uh, but that's okay. So uh, I think we'll go. I think we'll go on to Elizabeth um, Blackburn, um, and there she is. Um, hopefully that's updated. No. <laughs> Why was it do that to me? Again, it's it's not a stream unless there are technical problems. There's technical difficulties. <laughs> Oh, I see. Why I think you might also it. still have the photo of Brad. I up. do, I do. It got confused, and that was probably what was doing it. So there we there go. We, go. We, we have we have her. So that's uh, Elizabeth Blackburn. Um, let's talk about her a little bit now. Um, uh, <laughs> where's our Wikipedia? Cue <laughs> where's card? our Wikipedia cue card? Um, yeah, it, it, it's mainly because this is about this one's a, a lot about biology. It's very bio. Biological. biologically heavy and that gets beyond like our areas of expertise, expertise. but I, I mean i guess that itself is a good reason why um yeah like it, it's hard to become an expert in any one area because well so any more than like one area is because there's just so, so much, much to know so anybody who ever comes to me and tries to tell me that they're just, like they know a lot of science or something and i'm like no yeah, i don't know a lot of science uh, and i've been and it's what i do because matt, matt and i and i mean all the all of those of us who, that you guys know in the community who like to science communicate and everything we will all say that we, we know a decent amount of stuff about a decent amount of topics we do we are not experts in very many of them at all <laughs> It's it's like I, I call this I renamed this channel polymathic and it's not because I think I'm a polymath it's because I want this channel to be polymathic uh, in that it can cover a wide range of topics because I would be arrogant in the extreme if I was going to call myself a polymath. <laughs> um, but I can brag a little bit if I want. Um, <laughs> no, no. Um, anyway, uh, Elizabeth Blackburn. Um, she is another Nobel Prize winner. Uh, she um, won the Nobel Prize in 2009 for her work on telomeres. And for those who don't know, telomeres are the little bits of um, redundant code at the end of DNA strands that basically is used as sacrificial DNA when there's um, encoding errors. So uh, it basically protects your DNA from um, being destroyed as cells reproduce. Uh, over time, uh, the telomeres shorten, and uh, once you start get past the end of the telomeres, you're basically on borrowed time because your DNA starts to break down. And it's one of those side effects that the shortening of telomeres as you get older is one of the reasons for aging. Um, yeah. There, I, I actually have covered some 
DNA stuff because I did do a course in biomolecules and we looked at it, but this was years ago. <laughs> so I'm trying to remember. But yeah, you actually have chemical caps on the end of your DNA to sampling, but just, yeah, the replication process isn't perfect. It does start to break down. Yeah, look how well designed humans are. <laughs> Um, yes, nerdy things. biology is a branch of physics, but it's a branch that is very far out, and if I try standing on it, it'll probably snap <laughs> under the, the weight of my ignorance. <laughs> and I like that analogy, weight of my ignorance. So, um, she also, uh, she co-discovered, um, the, um, uh, enzyme, uh, tolerase, which, um, is used to help, um, replenish, um, telomeres. So effectively, uh, I won't say elixir of life because that would be uh, entirely ridiculous, but it, it's heading us down the road of being able to extend people's life because if you can repair telomeres, you can help people live for a little bit longer because you get less damage to the you'd DNA also, over time. You'd also slow... Oh, sorry. Um, aging. Y yeah, you'd slow aging because yes. that's what causes aging is the unraveling of the ends of your DNA, basically. Yeah. So it's like a string. You know when you cut a string and the ends sometimes fray? As that fraying gets further down on your DNA, if you want to, I know it's a string with two parts, but um, once it starts to unfray further down, then you, then the uh, cells start to age. So, yeah, we could probably stop that or slow it down well, at least. Th they have in in Th mice in laboratory experiments using the uh, Ptolemies. So, um, the the using the enzyme. So they've been able to lengthen the Ptolemies and. Um, actually extend the life of the rats or rats and mice in laboratories but i mean we haven't done tests on humans because there's ethics involved um yeah and, for some reason they're not terribly happy with just uh doing experiments on humans all the time yeah um yeah, yeah, talking which gets in the way talking which sometimes actually, i think um on the president's council for bioethics although she's australian she actually works in california and is has dual citizenship for Australia and the US. So she's at, she was actually yeah. a um uh an a um I was gonna say informer. This is not the advisor to President Bush. Um so um That could have been a tough job. Yeah, it was interesting because she was head of these um bio council of bioethics for the Bush administration, but he kicked her off it. And yet she was one of the main advocates for for ethics. So that sort of suggests that the Bush administration weren't heavy in on ethics. Because <laughs> they didn't yes. want her there. <laughs> you can draw some analogies Is to that... other parts um, of history as well. Or more modern history, history as well, I'm sure. Yes. <laughs> uh, but yes, when you're kicking off your ethics advisors from your committees, I would say that's a worrying sign. Yes. <laughs> but... Uh, I mean, it shows Australia's got some good exports. Got X-ray crystallography. We've got you know potential processes to help stop aging, and we also can send some of our best people out. Not always, you know. Based on if anyone was on Heretical's chat last night, you'll probably know that there's a few people. Well, we were chatting about a couple of people that, well, one in particular that was not one of our best exports. But um, see if we do try and make up for it. We've got some good people to send around i think nerdy's happy that they're like extending the life of rodents because it's good for him <laughs> <laughs> i used to have pet mice actually my nickname at high school was nibbles but it yeah. turns out the person the teacher that started that nickname was arrested as a pedophile oh that's 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 dreadful <laughs> yeah um they were very very old things he was arrested for compared to when i was at the school but yeah so that one was elizabeth blackburn who do you want to do next um matt so, i'm gonna so, leave that one so up to you I got a list. i've lost um, the list for the moment it's in front of um, you now it's in front of you <laughs> oh yes it is uh do, do, do. oh let's go I, I actually want to have a look at mawson just because mawson. Douglas why not? Mawson. Uh, uh, we can talk about whether he actually did what he what did he claimed what he claimed i mean that do. photo says it all it does but, doesn't he but, he looks shifty yeah. i mean we shouldn't say things like that because it was probably he probably sat there for ages for this photo <laughs> yes back in those days but basically so mawson was an explorer and he's most famous for his work down in antarctica where he explored 
he claimed, he did, he said he explored quite a fair bit of the continent. Um, he his team claimed they went to one of the major mountains there as well as getting to the actual magnetic south so. pole. Um, and they've got Mawson's hut named after him. So there's like I, I believe the like it's now the research station. Session. Yeah, Mawson's kind of research. The, yeah. Station. Yep. So one of our, because um, Australia actually owns the largest portion of Antarctica for any country, because yeah, well, we're so close to it. That, yeah, that's why we're, it's easy for us to send things there. So we actually own, was it? So yeah, but... half of Antarctica, I think, is unclaimed, and of the other half, we have forty percent of it well, is, like is under it, Australian it's, jurisdiction. It's, yeah. Um, it's yeah, kind of, it, I, explored... I love the fact that he's he's. Um put in as being part of the heroic age of antarctic exploration because so many people died uh, and that was the yeah. thing they they got out there with their sleds and their dogs and half of them didn't come back or if not more in some expeditions none of them came back so it, yeah. it was a big thing to Dude, go just, but it is also known um, that a lot of them didn't actually go where they said they went they said i made it i did it and it's like but current current um, historians looking back at it and looking for the evidence are going, um, yeah, possibly you didn't. That they're pretty sure he made it to the magnetic South Pole, um, but they're not sure that they actually went up Erebus because at the time when he was there, it would have been really difficult to do, and they think that it would it would not have been possible to have gone up Erebus at the time when he was there so they think he sort of went there and go that's too hard we'll just say we did it everybody on side for that <laughs> because the, who's you, going to check <laughs> I, yeah and i guess you can make the argument that you you don't really blame them for that given how many people didn't return like yeah. it was possible that you would go sailing to antarctica and the ship would never come back I could just get trapped in an ice shelf. Not, I think, more common with the with the, with the Arctic than the Antarctic. But yeah, there was because you also get um, crevices in the the ice. So the circular ice formations, um, you get these gaps under there, and this is what you see happening in all of the movies. And it gets this thin layer of snow on the top, and all these cracks, and you can't see them. So you go over the top, and you come crashing down into it and you get caught and so i think a bunch of people have disappeared that way yeah. or there was one expedition i believe i can't remember if that was australian or not where they lost their supplies because the person carrying the supplies the sled went over one of these first and it went there wasn't that what happened with the, scott's um, expedition i think so yeah, yeah. and they then made i mean most back, of, well or some the, of them made they it back. almost made yeah. it back they they because they were found but didn't they all didn't they actually all die on the last expedition? Oh, that's oh yes, yeah. they did on the last one. Yeah, but um, they but were they found. They, they made it almost they started, there. <laughs> didn't they reckon they died because they started eat? Well, one of them at least because they started eating the um, the, yeah. the dogs and they ate the livers without cooking them, which is toxic. After and as a while. Nerdy said, "I'm going out. I may be some time." <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> Because that's oh, actually credited as the last words of Scott, so... Um, uh, uh, yes. Whether or not it is or I, isn't, I, didn't know that, I mean, actually. it's difficult it's because idea. I think it was one of the... Um, uh, I, yeah, I, no, I, don't, I, I think it was a journal entry that that was what he'd said, because as far as I remember, none of them survived, but they were found. The, yeah. the ones who were still in the camp were found later, because yeah. basically they got caught in a blizzard on the way back and they had no idea where they were. And they weren't very mm. far from where the they actually <laughs> one they of were the supposed exploring to be, teams, which is kind of I, I believe it was also this one. Um, they found like an ice cave where they sheltered in, so they didn't have to put up their tent. And one of the dogs refused to leave with them, so they left the dog there. And we they since found the dog frozen there, and it had broken its leg, and that's why they couldn't get it to move. That's why they didn't oh. want to leave with them. So they actually found the the poor dog with its broken leg because it just got in, like frozen into the the ice cave. So it was preserved because you can actually go down to like the original huts that people like Mawson used, and there's still food. There's edible food there because it's Antarctica. It's so cold, cold that yeah. it just survives. It's like a freezer. <laughs> it, it well, you get the same thing on Mount still, Everest where um, the climbers yeah. who die are left on the side, of the, and they just frozen in time, and it's. You can actually it's use them as creepy. way markers because there's now quite a few of them. So many people climb yes. Everest that 
And some um, of them, they don't know who they are the now. Portion. There, there's, a, there's well over a thousand people just on the slopes of Everest and you can't get them down. Yeah. It's, uh, but although they do have a thing now yeah. with Everest that if you're a climber going up, you have to bring back a certain amount of rubbish that isn't yours. Mm, yes, because humans are really good at cleaning up after oh, themselves. It, it's, it's, apparently it's atrocious, the amount of rubbish that, you know, chocolate wrappers that are along the side of the walkway. <laughs> it's, like, disgusting. Although, look, the Ameri- I think it was the Americans actually brought a nuclear reactor to Antarctica to try and set up there and run, and it was known as leaky. Or like Queen Leaky or something because oh, it was okay. known for leaking its um, nuclear fuel. Damn, damn. <laughs> and and parts of that are still there. There, um, but this is probably one of the good reasons why handing Antarctica pretty much over to the scientists. So like the people who control who goes in and out is like scientific bodies, um, and that actually is much greater for preservation for Antarctica because such a fragile ecosystem. But it is not friendly to people. It is not easy to explore. Like, if you want to go driving, like, the snowmobiles, even the special made ones, over some areas, because of what I mentioned earlier, you need to end up with these, what are essentially land sonars ahead of the vehicle. And you have to drive, like, a few kilometers yeah. an hour. And they keep sending signals, and they will pick up whether it's hollow under the, the first, like, half a meter or so of the ice. So you have enough warning to stop the vehicle, and you can. So they put, like, posts everywhere and you've got to do it every year because it changes um, with every I think every time you get I forget which season it is but every year the, the cycle just changes the landscape under it and you can't see what's changed Yeah. so yeah it, it's, it's not a safe place to go so the people who go there you got to give them credit even if they didn't quite do everything they cleaned well, especially back then when it was so hard to do <laughs> I mean it's mm. a lot easier now they've got they can helicopter people in and out and they can We've got the big well when there's breakers, no blizzards. When there's no blizzards, but we've also got the big icebreakers and mm-hmm. and that. So which they didn't yes. have. That I mean they, you know, the the ships that they went back to even early in the night in the 20th century was, yeah, you know, they just went up to it. <laughs> well, they they made it, but it was da- incredibly dangerous. It's still dangerous now, but it was even more dangerous. So. And of course, also, we've got I proper noticed... bases there now oh. that, um, yeah, with heating and they manned... build out and they're manned yeah. and they've got power. Are they... And... <laughs> are they manned? I think some of them are manned all oh, yeah. year round now. Oh yeah. We we now have at least one base that is permanently manned. Whereas before, it wasn't really easy to do that in winter, but now we've got the technology to keep them running safely through the whole year. Because the Antarctic winter is a nightmare to to keep any anything alive that isn't from antarctica yeah <laughs> the penguins do all right but i think to go back to nerdy's earlier comment um i don't think we're meant to we're allowed to talk about the penguins guarding the ice wall because uh the illuminati will come and get us so uh they don't exist yeah and, and there's definitely not an ice wall that's in no <laughs> i know you lot were talking yeah, about it I in know. the chat <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's just so stupid because it's like, you, like why would it be cold around the entire edge? Like it make uh, at least at the poles it makes sense. Uh, yeah, but uh. they don't. They don't have to make sense, do they? <laughs> if it, if what they said made sense, they wouldn't be flat earthers. <laughs> oh. the, the kings of nonsense. Okay, uh, I reckon we should um, head towards Graham Clark for the next one. Because um, I think he, he'll be one that most people will probably actually at least know of, even if they don't know exactly who he is. Um, and I'd better double check to make sure that... Yep, we got the right picture up. So, um, Graham Clark was the uh, inventor of the cochlear implant. Um, that lovely little implant that helps a lot of deaf people here. So... Um, I'm yeah. pretty sure Have most you... people will know who he is. Well, know of him. Um, so he was professor of... Uh, yeah, I'm going to say this wrong. Uh, Otolon... Ot- <laughs> uh, help, Matt. <laughs> um, Otolon... Uh, <laughs> oh, no, I can't do this. Oh, why can't they just use English words? Why do they have to... Otolaryngology. Otolaryngology. I would say it is. 
something. Yeah. Uh, we'll, we'll go with that. Um, <laughs> well, I will, yes. I will copy that word into the chat. This is the word that Matt and I are trying to say. <laughs> yes. And if anyone in the chat thinks they can say it better, wait a minute. Oops. <laughs> no. So, but like, if you've ever seen videos of like when they've been like given the deaf kids, like little kids cochlear implants so they can hear yeah. for the first time. And then they hear like their parents' voice and their their reactions on their face. It's amazing, but yeah, this this is probably one of us. One of it, it, I don't know what would be first position, but it's probably one of the best or one of the best known inventions that's come out of Australia in modern yeah. times. It, it's so powerful, but what it does is so it replaces the cochlea because it's got the cochlear implant now. The way the ear works, you've got your yeah, your, yeah, you've got the, all the the three little bone. I think it's the three bones. Yes, um, the hammer, the eardrum, and that goes it essentially pushes into the cochlea. And so as the drum moves, it pushes the fluid in it back and forward. And there's little hairs in the cochlea, and as they wave, that's how your ear detects sound. Hmm. So if you get tinnitus, it's because the hairs have actually been essentially pushed over and not quite snapped, but permanently bent at an angle. So there's always nerves going off. Um, I, I actually get tinnitus quite badly because I uh, my ears are overly sensitive, so it picks up on a little bit too much, which means I, I do get it every now and then. Um, even though I haven't got ear damage, it's it's annoying, but um, at least I don't need anything for it. Whereas this invention, what it does is for people who don't really have a working cochlea, this goes kind of bypasses it and can help send the signal straight to the the nerves. And so it, it bypasses a fair bit of the ear. So for all these deaf people, it, it's ascent, it's very close to having a bionic ear. And the, uh, it's just amazing technology. I don't quite understand the, the biology and the, the medicine of how it works beyond what I'm, I'm trying to say. But the bits that it replaces, it, it's just amazing how it does it. So, yeah, he, he definitely needed a spot on this list. And, yeah, I mean, it's quite amazing what he did. Um and he's uh, actually a doctor. He is actually a doctor, Dr. Graham Clark. Mm. So, yeah. So, not almost a doctor, <laughs> he is actually a doctor. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, dear. <laughs> yeah. So, one of my friends from uni works for, for Cochlea. Um, and I've heard that it's... A, and from what I think they've said, they, they do enjoy working there. It's a very nice place to work. I imagine with the sort of work they do, I can understand that. Yeah. Um, so there we go. It's it's a workplace that's not too bad and yeah, very nice invention. But yeah, I'm I'm curious um, for people in the chat whether you'd heard of um, here specifically if you'd heard of um, Dr. Graham. Oh, sorry, uh, yeah, Graham Clark. Sorry, Dr. Graham I was Clark. Yeah. A different Clark in my head. Um, or the cochlear implant. I'm just curious as to how many people outside <laughs> of Australia have, uh, have heard of that. Don't know. But native atheist says he looks like Larry David. <laughs> And I've taken his picture off, but yes, I can see the resemblance there. <laughs> but yeah, All right. Okay. Um, I. Oh, I just I just noticed in in our um our little notes here, he studied at Sydney Uni. Yeah. He did his medicine at Sydney Uni. Oh, he's the, oh, he's a college boy. Oh, Scott. Oh, I don't know too much about Scott's college. Um. I think, oh, actually, they one of the ones that now has a bad reputation. I can't remember. One of them's had, some of them have had a few, um, some of the colleges at the uni have had problems in the last, well, I'd say a few years, but it's not a few years, about um, uh, consent. But, um, yeah, no, Sydney Uni, oh, he's a fellow Sydney Uni boy. Yep. Sorry, that's where I'm doing my, my degree at the moment, well, my PhD, so. All right. Um, I noticed that. Do we want to move back to physics for us? <laughs> Probably. We actually know what we well, We have some idea. Of, we have some idea about, about this about guy. But, um, so I will bring up Mark Oliphant. Where's our picture? There it is. That's actually come um, up. Assuming there's no technical errors. No, it didn't um, come up. It did yep, come up. That's up. He's definitely Good. there. So Ma Mark Oliphant uh, is a really interesting character because he not only was a. Um, a uh, very prominent physicist of his time. He was also a politician. So um, 
he was briefly governor of um, South Australia. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's South ordinary. Australia. Does that count? Uh, yeah, but I mean, he was also involved in the um, founding of the <laughs> Australian Democrats, which was a political party in Australia, um, not like the American Democrats at all. More, more a middle of the road party. Um, but yeah, they died out a few few years back. They they threw all their weight behind a certain campaign, and it got them absolutely no seats. <laughs> Um, mm. I remember it well. Matt's probably not quite old enough to remember it. But, no, uh, it was just bef- that was probably just before my time. Yeah, um, you, pro- you would have been you would have been around, but you wouldn't have been into politics. You wouldn't have been old enough to be into. <laughs> no, um, but pity we don't have Chris with us tonight because Chris would have been able to go off on this. But um... <laughs> yes, it would be much more his area. Yeah, it would be his oh. area. But however, the physics is more for Matt and I because um, yes. So the first of the things I think that we can probably go through he was working on was the microwave radar. It's not the most exciting. We'll get to, there's another, a bigger set of things that he worked on. But the first thing that he did, he worked on microwave radar. So what he did is he actually got the wavelength down. And he did that in, I think, 38 to, what, early 40s. So during, like, the Battle of Britain time when, and he was working for the British there. And what that did is when you shorten those wavelengths, you get better resolution, yeah. which is very important when you're hunting for small objects like that have U-boats. a lot of other objects similar sized. So, yeah, U-boats in the water, because what happens from a distance, you can hit, you can find U-boats um, when they surface because the conning tower sticks up enough. Yeah. But as you get closer, the way, like, just the way the radar works you have to switch the wavelength to shorter and shorter so that you can start to see where uh the like you need to pick up better resolution but of course you get to the point where it's like okay now i can't tell the difference between the waves and the u-boat because it's all the The same same resolution but what they used to do is they take these radars and they'd put them on planes and the planes would be able to fly around in the pitch black and they ended up using the the uh, uh, microwave radars that he developed to hunt for U-boats. So they'd have a radar on the plane. It would find the U-boat surfaced at night, and it would start moving towards the U-boat. Like, well, like the pilots would steer it. And right when, and when they managed to get the wavelength down, you would be so close to the U-boat by the time that, um, res- like you lost the ability to see it on the radar, that you would be in visual range. So they had a yeah. giant spotlight attached to underneath the wing of the plane. So as you, you came through, all of a sudden the people on the U-boat would probably hear an engine and then just have a bright light flashed in their face and the plane would be heading right for them. And it would take about oh, it's nearly it's like 40 seconds to a minute to dive a U-boat under emergency cir- circumstances. You would not have enough time. And so the German... Like, these were the U-boats were sinking all the merchant marines, so the, the British were able to help. That was one of the things that helped turn the tide in the Atlantic War. Sorry, I'm a nerd about this as well. I like I do like my history for this part. Um, but they did. the Germans did actually have a detector for these devices. They actually could pick up that change in the, the wavelength, but eventually the, um, Krieg, like the Kriegsmarine High Command, the U-boat arm, thought that the British had de- developed a detector for their detector. Which doesn't make any sense at all, but still. <laughs> well, it, it did send out a... Sne- it actually sent out a radio signal that interacted with the incoming oh, radar. Oh, okay, so they didn't just detect the incoming yeah, radar it, signal. It, yeah, you could actually... So it, it did give a signal. The British had no such thing. They just cracked the Enigma code, and so they knew where the U-boats were going to be. Yeah. And they were also triangulating all of their radio waves, even though they were sending radio signals in about two and a half seconds because they pre-recorded their messages. And that would just be like a, like a spring... Um, like a metal coil that unraveled and sent the message really quickly. But the British were so organized that they could pick up. Um, They actually coordinated every single signal that was pinged from any radar or like radio station they had anywhere, including boats. So they're still able to pick up where they were. And so the Germans told them to switch off the radar detector. So this radar got that. So I I love this area of history, but... um, but, I mean, it was amazing what <laughs> he did because my... up until his work on the radar, on on these microwave radars, um, the the smallest radar was, what, uh, 150 
Um, 150 centimeters, and he got it down yeah, to 10 and, centimeters. And he, yeah, <laughs> so more than a tenfold decrease in the the, the width. And, and basically, it gets harder and harder to produce um, beams when you get to short wavelengths. So yeah, that's a big problem with lasers as well. The short. This is why um, the most common lasers you see are red and then green. You don't yeah. see a lot of blue lasers. I do actually have a blue laser, but it's much weaker than the other two and also why x-ray ray lasers are very hard to make but i think it's a similar thing with um radar particularly for the technology they had at the time because you also need to start miniaturizing components and the ability to do that was more difficult so he did that but he also worked on the manhattan project oh yes and you've got a question the for jenny morgan because this is definitely a question for you because i have no idea what jenny's talking about <laughs> no, Hedy Lamar's frequency jumping. I think it wasn't to do. I think with radar, it was to do with sending um, a secure radio message. So what it did was oh, it had I, a yes, yeah, like a preset change so that instead of sending the radio signal at a given frequency so when you have like radio stations like, like the common ones around here, let's say it was a hundred megahertz, um, that's commercial radio. But um, they would probably use longer wavelengths in the military at the time. Um, the enemy could listen in. And even if they couldn't decode everything, you could still locate things. But what would happen is that this would end up jumping and just sending portions. Um, so Hedy Lamar was an actress, I believe, too. Mm. But she developed this, like, secure communication technology in World War Two. It's amazing. Like, she must yeah. have been very smart. Well, the different I, people I, who did different things. Um, yeah, it's absolutely amazing. But I, yeah, I but what it did, yeah. Oh, sorry, I was just saying, so what it did is you'd send a portion of the message at one frequency and it would ra jump to what would be a seemingly random, like, other frequency, send another bit, then jump to another one. And it, and she developed a, a method that you would be able to have both ends would know where the jumps were going to be so that you could actually change, like, it would just be moving different frequencies and you'd get their entire message. But an enemy trying to listen into it, not knowing any of the, the settings in the... Um, radio signals would just hear static they wouldn't actually hear anything that came close to a, a full radio message so they wouldn't even know that you were communicating or if they did they'd get like a blip and they wouldn't know where the rest of the message was i so love your typo there like... jenny <laughs> she did correct it afterwards it's, it's supposed to be she got the idea from player piano <laughs> song roles <laughs> <laughs> I was about, I was, yeah, I didn't want to have to ask what that was. <laughs> but yeah, it, it's that one, that one is pretty impressive. Yeah. Um, <laughs> have I heard? But yes, that one's, she was, she was an American um, actress. So uh, yeah. I guess back to our story. Oh, we love di diverging too. Uh, that was an interesting oh, yeah, divergence. <laughs> uh, Manhattan Project, because um, Mark Oliphant, was part of the Manhattan Project, so we had yes, an Australian Aussie. in yeah, an Aussie in as part of uh, the Manhattan Project. Uh, he had a, did a lot of work in um, the realm of nuclear fusion, which for the Manhattan Project yes. meant working on the H bomb. <laughs> yes, so I'm not sure he did too much before, like like for the actual war nukes effort. that were used yeah. in World War Two. Although, I mean, arguably, if he was working on the Manhattan Project. It would be for the war effort. Well, he would have been for the, the war effort. Thing yeah. was set up for that, but in terms of like most things he worked on, were more things that came later. Because as we mentioned, yeah, the hydrogen bomb was. Uh, what year did the Americans first test it? Um, test the hydrogen bomb. It was fifties? Oh, was it? Yeah, uh, he started working. Uh, I've got on fifty three. The, uh... I'm just going to. I mean, he Google got involved with um, the University of Birmingham because he was in England for the war effort um, in 1940. So he started working um, in this sort of stuff with. Um... My first H bomb. I, I had 53 in my head. I was off yeah. by a year. Um, 52. Yeah, so, so I mean, yeah, he was, was part of the war. Manhattan Project prior to the H bomb, but a lot of the work that he's known for is to do with nuclear fusion. Uh, he helped develop the H bomb after the war, uh, but he also was involved in the Manhattan Project in the development of the original uh, H bomb. Yes. So I mean, I like, I like how. Oh, sorry. So uh, so uh, yeah. Frisch and Paris, um, who 
did the first memorandum on the atomic bombs and using them along with Oppenheimer and people like that. Uh, one of the first people they showed their paper to about how to do this was Oliphant because he was considered an expert in this field, this virgining field of virgining, virgining, virgining field of um, nuclear physics. And um, he was the, one of the people they went to. Uh, you know, he was up there with Oppenheimer as people who actually knew what this was all about. And um, yeah, so he got he got involved uh, yeah. from Britain with what was happening with the Manhattan Project. Um, yeah. Um. Because, I mean, I think a lot of people just think, oh, the Manhattan Project was purely an American project. It wasn't. It, it no, wasn't it, was, it was an allied it project. It was an allied because project. Because they were just like, we need to get this working. It was, yes, predominantly American, okay. but it, it was pretty much anybody in the Allies with expertise. We, we and he was one of, the, one of the major expertise. He'd done work in Cambridge in their little... Um, their little underground bunker lab where they were messing with um, <laughs> splitting the atom <laughs> effectively yes. in, in a basement. Uh, uh, as you do as in the basement do, of any yes. building. <laughs> so yeah, he yeah, was one of those people who um, had worked with um, separate. Uh, yeah, no, so with, um, so if Cambridge vision. ever disappears in a blinding flash one day, we'll know what it was. We'll know what it was. Somebody um, was playing in the in the bunker. <laughs> Yes. See, yeah, this yeah. is this is why Nerdy and I need to team up. Then we can use our, a team of rodents to run the reactor, and then we don't need to worry about humans uh. snitching on us. <laughs> can you imagine a nuclear reactor run by rats? Sorry, I don't know why I'm thinking of that now. Um, although, I, I mean, I guess on that, yes, the Manhattan Project, you, know, you can say whatever you want about the nukes. A lot of the people there were... Um, well, they were not entirely like okay with the uh, the use of the weapons they didn't really fully understand what it was going to be used for so i think yeah it's, it, we shouldn't probably tar him with the brush of well he helped you know build all these nukes because he was probably from his point of view just doing a lot of what he thought was useful science as most of them did and if you read a lot of their comments i think all but one of the scientists in the manhattan project stayed on after the war finished yeah. so once the bombs dropped and they actually saw what the project was being used for i think most of the, the scientists left i don't remember exactly when he left but i'm also having a look at one of the comments he said he was meant to have um well he remarked that he, he said he felt proud or well, sort of proud that the bomb had worked but and absolutely appalled at what had been done to yeah. human beings so i think that was what a lot of them had they they were in it for the science and not in it for the, the destruction that came out of it. Unfortunately, nobody's dropped a hydrogen bomb in anger. But you yeah. could theoretically use them to make a working fusion reactor. Because, you, cause, yeah, we can't control fusion yet to generate electricity, but you could use hydrogen bombs and try and harness the energy from that. Yeah, I mean, Oliphant knew that they were making a bomb because he was, a lo he was really well in on the... Of the war effort, yeah. and he knew what was going. Oh, yeah, he knew what was going on. He knew that they were going to make the bomb, but I don't think any of them were prepared for what the bomb was going to mean, and that they thought the bomb was just going to be a deterrent, not something used to kill people. I mean, yeah, effectively, that the Americans could have set off the bomb anywhere, and it would have stopped the Second World War because you know once somebody's got that uh, kind of power. Look, it's a hard one because it's not that easy. Because I have looked at this um, before. It was actually something I looked at for year 12. Like one, yeah, of, one it, of the major essays I had to do for, because... for history was on this. And Japan, yes, there were elements of the government that already wanted to sue for peace before the bombs were dropped. But once they dropped the first one, the government was already trying to cover it up and saying it was a natural disaster. And they actually didn't come to the... I, I don't can't remember if they came to the negotiating table, but they refused to surrender after the first one. And it took the emperor stepping in on one of the government meetings after the second bomb had been dropped to say, no, guys, this is enough. We have to stop, which was something the emperor normally wouldn't do in those meetings. He wouldn't say anything. He was just there as a figurehead. But it took him stepping in and he was seen as something like a god to his people. It took him stepping in saying, no, we're done. We can't keep going. So, it, yeah, it's a it's a very hard question as to, to what would happen. But they did deliberately target civilian cities. They, they targeted c cities with very little military use 
or industry use. 90% yeah. of uh, Japan's industry had already been destroyed by American bombing by that point. But they chose civilian targets because they wanted to make it hard for the government to cover it up and also send a message that we will wipe your country from the face of the earth and you will you and we won't have to come near you um so yeah it was a it's when you look at what information they had it's yeah it's not an easy question to answer as to whether they um, but my, my point being that... Whether it, it was know, the right thing to do. Yeah, it depended on how much you had to do to force a hand, and I'm not sure they actually knew exactly how much force they had to No, to they, to and that. if you look, they estimated they actually had to invade Japan, and they were, like they didn't know about the radiation fallouts from these things. They had they, they That was not something that was well understood. They just, you know, like they had some idea it was a thing, but they didn't know the extent. And to them, it was to just a really big bomb. Because, yeah. Yeah, this they, still they, hadn't been, the they hadn't been doing it long enough to know yeah, the long Yeah, it's very term. easy for us to look back now with, the, with you know, yeah. 60, 70 years of scientific know-how. Um, yeah, but at the time, at the time. It, was, it was like, the, the, when you look at, like, the president's decision to drop it, it was, well, the invasion is expected to cost us, I think it was expected to cost, like, 2 million casualties. Yeah. On top of everything else they'd fought for, and they'd seen how hard the Japanese fought for Okinawa, well, Iwo Jima, then Okinawa, particularly Okinawa, where the entire Japanese garrison pretty much got wiped out rather than surrender. And it was the first battle where the Japanese inflicted more casualties than they took, even though they had a higher death ratio. Or like yeah, a you can look count. at it from the point of view um, that the atomic bomb was horrendous and it killed a lot of people, but uh, conventional war in Japan yeah. was going to kill a lot and more. It's, yeah, and the, the Japanese government was preparing every single civilian in the country or as many that was possible to fight, even with just sharpened bamboo sticks. And that was what that was also what the Americans were like understood of what the country was like so yeah it was hard to but, and it's um, but it's also hard to gauge the politics of the time as well so, yes it was a you yeah we, we, like japan's politics at the time were way more confusing yeah like it's not like we've done these people again. are in charge and they're the only ones but yes <laughs> we're sorry. talking about yeah, the, we're, we're good. the atrocities of wars instead of the achievements of um mark oliphant um now, as far as the, as far as it goes with the uh, Manhattan Project, uh, he um, he um, they, uh, the, the description in, in Wikipedia is inspired, but that's kind of wrong because um, um, Oliphant actually pioneered the technique. But he um, he worked with um, Lawrence to convert the cyclotron that um, Lawrence had built as part of their testing of uh, is Lawrence Livermore or no? Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah. Um, so the Lawrence of Moore had. He, I mean, he'd um, he'd built this cyclotron so that they could um, examine the properties of the atoms, so that they could get a better idea of how, what they were doing. You know, a cyclotron is basically a particle, a, a smaller particle accelerator, basically. Um, and um, what happened then was um, uh, Oliphant had uh, figured out a way to use a cyclotron to enrich uranium which is what you need to make the nuclear bombs or re enrich plutonium i think it was at the time for the yeah, first one yeah that's why a nuclear reactor can't you can't get like a, a, bomb a nuclear, from a nuclear, reactor. Like a nuclear yeah. bomb out of a regular nuclear reactor you need extra steps yes so he fi he figured out a way they could use the he developed this technique for using a synclotron in the experiments they'd done in cambridge for doing nuclear fission that you could use this to enrich uranium so they make it sit easier to... I'm amazed they didn't blow Cambridge up, to be perfectly honest. <laughs> it's actually really hard to do, though. It, it is really action. hard to like, do. Like, um, but like yeah, they developed this technique. Uh, he'd actually pioneered it, pioneered it in um, 1934 um, for how to enrich um, pluto plutonium and uranium. So without that, the bomb would never have been made in the first place. Um, because without the rich, the rich plutonium, you just didn't have it. So, um, yeah, it's, um, quite amazing the, um, achievements he had, but it's not just in that because later on, uh, the big things he's known for after this, you say, Oh, you, you've done radar and you, you were part of the Manhattan project. What could you possibly do after this? Nuclear fusion. <laughs> He is considered one of the fathers of modern nuclear fusion. He helped develop the um, tokamak 
designed for um, fusion reactors that is the current leading system, the big donuts, basically, that they yes. accelerate. Um, um, use giant magnets to hold the material because it gets to the heat of the sun and we don't have any metal or any material that will survive. Yeah. So what you do is you suspend it with a uh, magnet and one of the hard things to do is to keep the reaction going long enough that you get enough energy back that you could so, actually run any power plant off it. Um, but that whole idea, which is, yeah, still the leading and most promising method to date to actually get a working fusion, fusion reactor. reactor. It's like a mini sun. Comes um, from him. Yeah. <laughs> he can, can go up yeah, with he, it. Well, he, all, was, he was the yeah. co-discoverer of trinium, um, helium-3, and nuclear fusion. So he he and I, I can't remember the name name of the person he worked with. That's what I was trying to find in amongst here. Um, yeah, I, it's gonna it's gonna take me a while to dig it out. But he was the co he was a co discovery of, of the major elements that you need to to make uh, nuclear fusion a little easier because if you use trinium, um, it's a lot easier to do fusion with uh, helium three and trinium than it is with um, helium. Sorry, yeah, we just um, just plain hydrogen, hydrogen, hydrogen one. Fusion. Yeah, so protons so you're, essentially. Yeah, but it's a lot easier to do it if you've got a he slightly heavier elements, basically. Um, it's like we, well, yeah, which is weird because you think really heavy elements are harder to fuse, but no, when you're talking about hydrogen, a slightly heavier hydrogen or a slightly heavier helium is actually easier because the um, chemi chemical bonds, the um, electron electronic bonds within the um, Things actually help you do the fusion at that point for with with helium and and hydrogen. So basically, them discovering that helped lead to, to kind of fusion having fusion happen, and then he helped develop the tokamak. Uh, the so yeah, he also to um, add to Nerdy's comment which with one? a nuclear reactor, which is maybe one way you'd be able to parallelize and is strong enough to actually for a shark to actually cut through a person. Extreme laser still have to be pretty donut. close to them. <laughs> that one. <laughs> uh, you're never gonna. He's never gonna let you forget about laser sharks. <laughs> no, he's never gonna forget about laser sharks. Yeah, man, Jenny's right. Yeah, the hardest part about making a nuclear bomb, uh, well, aside from having to enrich the uh, plutonium or uranium first before you do it, is. Um, setting off the triggers so that you can um, compress the matter to the point yeah. of becoming critical. Which is why, they, so they actually used, when they dropped the two on Japan, they were different types of bomb. Um, whereas the one, the plutonium one is, is theoretically easier to make, but it's harder to get right, if that makes sense, in that it... Yeah. Um, but it's it's not the prefer it is actually the preferred way to make nu plain nuclear bombs, uh, and yeah, you'd need to have conventional explosives go off. And they didn't, and they knew that the technique would work. They actually knew that li that little boy would work, but they didn't know whether they could actually get the electronics to good work. enough that the explosion would go off at the same time, so it'd be compressed perfectly. Because if it was slightly off. Yeah, it would the, put, it the would, whole explosion it go, doesn't happen. Which was the one they tested, I believe. Uh, they tested in the desert in 1940. No, no, it was early 1945. Um, they te well, earlier in 1945, yeah. a couple so, of months before they dropped the other two. Um, it was it's, it was an impressive development. I mean, they even had to develop, um, help develop new explosives to actually perform it because the explosives they were using at the time weren't precise enough to actually trigger in the way that they needed to to set off the bomb. So the, mm. everything about the bomb had to be developed for the bomb. That That's how critical every bit of the um, development was, which is pretty impressive yeah. when you consider it. You know, the, the number of different fields from chemistry to particle physics to that uh, had to be come together and be involved. It was why it was a completely an ally effort to do it. It's, and it's probably why, because uh, the Germans themselves were also working on the atomic bomb at, um, towards the end of the Oh, they were World nowhere War. near it. They were they, nowhere near it. They were working it on it. Because they didn't no. have as many scientists to, to call on as the Allies did. 
Yes, a lot of their scientists who actually knew what they were doing, it all fled, fled. by that yeah, point. Well, most of them were Jewish, and they probably would have been put in concentration camps if they hadn't yes, fled. Yes, Einstein's oh. the good example there. But also, they didn't have any uranium, <laughs> so they, they really couldn't really hard do to yes. do it. <laughs> they didn't get close to building a bomb. Hitler was actually not interested in nukes. He, he, he was, if you look at what he preferred um, the Germ uh, Germany to uh, put its efforts into, it was really really fancy versions of conventional weapons he really they didn't did have like the v2 uh, um yeah they they didn't yeah. think about any like putting a nuke in a v2 they or, weren't or thinking of what was even the conventional warheads they weren't overly keen on the whole v2 line of things we because i mean they could have had the first rocket air airplanes well they did but they weren't keen on the whole thing even even the first jets were viable for the germans to have in the Second World War, but they weren't considered important by Hitler or, or the uh, rest. One of the problems with their first, uh, one of their major, well, the first actual like uh, jet they put into production was the the Messerschmitt M um, ME two six two. Yeah. The problem with that was they had they were so strained for resources by that point that the I think the aluminium and the tungsten, I believe it was that or the chromium, they were they're short on all of these. Um, materials that they needed for the jet engines they didn't actually have so instead of making them out of aluminium they would just coat surfaces in aluminium so they had a like a, a lifespan of only about 23 hours so they'd last wow. like you'd have to build an entire engine that would last less than a day and I also don't think they had the technology to properly control the planes like it like the physical controls were now getting too weak to control a jet so, yeah, so they didn't the yet have the technology. And that. Yeah. But they did develop... They didn't really get many into production. These rockets that would launch vert vertically, they were literally like a giant like firework-type rocket that would launch um, a jet, like a, a rocket in the air, and they were used for intercepting Allied bombers. They would just... They launched it. They had a flight time of seven minutes. They'd just mm. wait until the bombers were really close, fly up. They'd get... They had like... 90 seconds of gunfire and then the idea was they most of the most of the plane the jet or the rocket whatever you want to call it was made of wood the pilot was meant to ram it into a bomber and he would eject his little capsule was made of metal and it would have a parachute wow. he'd jump out and the two would come crash and come back down to earth the rest of the plane was wood it would disintegrate and then they'd re-get that they'd put more rockets on it put the wood outsides on and they'd go again um but they never yeah, really got to, to that point. Like, they, we're talking like <laughs> like like this is this is you know, a couple of months into 1945, which for anyone who knows how Germany was going by that point, they didn't have much left. Um, and yes, they also most of their factories had holes in them because Allied bombers had been over at some point. Um, yeah. So, but they had the, these really really weird like ideas that they had. Um, and they also had a V3, but it wasn't a rocket. And who was it? Werner von Braun. <laughs> One of the ideas, I, I can't remember if it was him, but like the German scientists working on the V2, they wanted to send a manned rocket to space in the 40s. Yeah. And one of the ideas they had as a potential weapon, <laughs> which I'm sure... You know, maybe this is where a certain uh, US politician got their ideas from. Actually wanted to send up and put like a giant satellite array of mirrors that they could use to focus energy down onto Earth as a weapon. That was an idea that the Nazis actually had. The, I mean, there was no way they were going to be able to pull off something like that. Even now, it's very difficult. And in the 40s, there was no way. They had some really, really... Um, <laughs> crazy uh, ideas. <laughs> crazy ideas. Oh, Jenny's put something. I think the control issue was solved by NASA's precursor. Um, yeah, yeah. It was. I, I know it wasn't the the, the Germans who, who who fixed a lot of those control problems. But yes, I think we you want to move on probably as much as yeah. I could talk about history. Uh, I hours. mean, yeah, the history is <laughs> awesome, and um, but I think we pretty much cut, covered Mark Oliphant. I mean, he was pretty amazing. Uh, all these different things that he worked in. Um, He's probably only not ever got a... He probably only didn't get a... No, I mean, he's not live anymore. He probably only didn't get a Nobel Prize because most of the ones who worked on the Manhattan Project didn't. <laughs> yes, because it was probably... Yeah, it would yeah, have been... Yeah, it was looked as bad optics to give them. 
Yeah, I, and again, some of them you, you do have to feel sorry for. They didn't know... Like, they had an idea of what they were working on. They just didn't know how it was going to be used or, like, the extent but, but even those to which it did, was going to be they, they didn't know the extent... Of, yeah, they didn't know the extent of the... Of the of the fallout, <laughs> it's bad. Yeah, <laughs> of, of what was going to happen afterwards, and it was like they saw this as a potential way of ending uh, ending the war, but they had no say after building these bombs where they were dropped. Yeah, that that wasn't up to them. That wasn't. Up and to as them. I said, they, they, they were they picked um, civilian heavy cities. I think I think Hiroshima. Um, it's either Hiroshima or Nagasaki. It's also it's a very small city, but it sits in like a depression. It's got mountains around it, so it's like a bit of a bowl ge uh, geologically, which made it very suitable to te to use the bomb in. And that was one of the reasons they picked it. The third target that they were going to use it on was actually Kyoto. No, no, not to it was Tokyo. Sorry. Um, oh, but they were actually going to bomb one Tokyo. of the. Yeah, they actually thought of bombing Kyoto which was the like medieval capital of well it was capital until what the 50, no 60s i think the 1860s um it was like it was they but they didn't drop it because it, it was so culturally important they didn't want to level all of the uh they didn't want to use it on it they didn't think it was useful which is a bit weird compared to the targets they picked but yeah they they didn't want to level um kyoto with a with a nuke but they were going to level Tokyo was the next target. But they didn't have any more nukes. They used the two that they had. And they were in the process of making more. But apparently at the time, Stalin was not surprised when they told him they developed the nuke. So yeah, well, because the, Russia was working some, on them too. So. <laughs> well, Russia stole its notes from America. That's how they built theirs. Yeah. And so the argument is made that the reason Stalin wasn't surprised by it was he already knew because of spies. Yeah. Yeah, they already had. Which would though. say a lot about, yeah, um, they're meant to be helping each other and they're already spying on each other. But oh well. Sorry, I, right, <laughs> I so digress. I think we I think we've got time to do another one. Where what? I think we've so. got about a quarter of an hour. So I, I think. So yes. I, I was thinking we could do. Um, yeah, provided that's come up, it has. Yes. Cool. So, uh, David Corolli, uh, who is actually one of the few that we've talked about here, uh, uh, is who is actually still alive, because <laughs> um, he works at the CSIRO, which uh, is oh god, my brain's gone numb. Um, the Commonwealth uh, Scientific and I think it's I, I know the RO is re like research organization. I try. Um, what's the I? Com Commonwealth. I, I'm just gonna Google it. Sorry, give me a second. Yeah, hang on. Um, I should know this. I have been told it before. Uh, Commonwealth Scientific and Industrial Research Organization. That's it. <laughs> you beat me to it. Yeah. Because I had the link. Um, <laughs> it, it's, it's pretty much our, our government's um, scientific research, research body outside of universities. Yes, yeah. So it's a good... Well, they're mostly, um, it's mostly attached to universities in a lot of sense. Um, generally, yeah, you'll find they... the CSIRO things at universities and... But they do have independent, independent facilities. facilities. There's actually yes. one. There's actually one within running distance from my house. Oh wow! I've, I've been on site to. I've been on site to most of their sites in, in Perth, um, because I used to work for a company that did the IT work for them. So I used to go around and I go and see the work that they were doing. It was really good. I go and do the job, and then I go and take a gander at what the. It was cool because I'd had. I had to sign non-disclosure because I was in the buildings, so. Um, I could go, they, would, they would go and show me stuff. I, you know, I got to go and look at all the really cool stuff. But I didn't meet um, David J. Carley because he's um, based in Melbourne. So, but he is a um, pioneer in the in the in the field of at, uh, atmospheric sciences. So, um, and a big speaker on behalf of um, climate change in Australia. Um, he sort of made it, there's a um, there's there's a radio announcer in Australia called Alan Jones, and uh, probably anyone outside of Australia has no idea who he is, but Matt knows who he is. <laughs> I've been offered to meet him. Oh, really? Um, Poor you. I had so it was just before COVID, it was before COVID, so it wasn't going to happen. I probably would take the opportunity, but I'm trying to think who like which american like radio or, or like personality oh, you'd be closest to well, basically he's getting on a bit my dad's met him a few times 
But basically, um, Alan Jones he's, he's a nice is, person. Um, he's he's fairly nice in person, but he's fairly right wing and yeah. He's like right wing and he's conspiratorial. Change. Yes, is the way you describe him. He's not. The, he's not. Um, He's not at the same level as the guy who thinks that um, Alex Jones. Yeah, Alex. He's not the. Yeah, he's not. The yeah, same he's not thing that. He's not, like, he's not the, like Alex Jones. Like crazy, like flat Earth Illuminati type. But he is definitely but he a is very... and a, well, not a conspiratorial, but he's a, he's into conspiracies and he's definitely very right right, right wing. Um, yeah. But uh, he, David Cotter sort of rose to frame for um, challenging him. Which is interesting because David's background was when all the things about climate change were coming out. He was a climate sci- he was a scientist about atmospheric conditions, and he was a skeptic about climate change. Initially, he was convinced by working in the field that hang on, this is right, and then became a very powerful ad- advocate within Australia for climate change. You know, and, and argued Ben. Yeah, he did this big thing about arguing with Alan Jones. Just stood up to him. Just said you're a dick, basically, as you do in I, Australia. I, I, yeah, you dick. I, I used to be a climate change denier of sorts um, when I was younger because that's the information that was fed to me. And yeah, as I've got older, and particularly as I've been a scientist, yeah, I came to realise no, that there's a like science is very thorough. This many people must have a point. So I started looking more into it, and then I realised yeah, there is no way that single people could like like Alan Jones could actually have a point that somehow all the scientists have missed something basic i just love his statement the people who um, dedicate their Christmas. telling jones i i'm a client's us climate scientist and ellen jones is wrong <laughs> he's just basically <laughs> just said it to him in the middle of an interview yeah <laughs> uh yes i i mean look I, I i would like if if i could meet people like that i would uh well obviously i'd i'd meet um <laughs> uh, uh, David um, Carroll, he I, he'd be a doctor, I imagine, like a like PhD. Oh doctor, yeah, he's a PhD. He? Yeah, um, yeah. He's. Yeah. Um, uh, I mean, we've got his contributions with climate change. Um, which uh, yeah, he also worked with ozone stuff, didn't he? Too? Yeah, he did. He um, uh, he did. He I'm wrote actually, a lot I, of like, the I, early papers on the ozone hole um, uh, and, and, and El Nino and how that affects Australian climate and etc. So. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, that's I've actually, yeah, come across um, a lot of work on those things. Not his, because his was early work. Well, I've considering a lot of his work would have been recent. group work as well. I mean, especially later on when you, yeah. you're talking about he was the uh, he was the lead author for the um, intergovernmental panel on climate change, so the IPCC. So lead author Which for our an international has thing. To so thoroughly. Oh yeah, our, our government. Well, we have some of the lead scientists in the world that contribute to inf- uh, science scientific papers to climate change. CSIRO is the CSIRO is actually respected around the world for the work. And, it and does. most of our current government, most of the leaders in our current gov- government, are Deniers. even if they don't want to admit it on car- on camera. Well, some have, some don't, but they are all climate deniers. Oh, very um, much so. Which and the um, funders of the CSIRO. Yes, um, it's it's had huge cuts to its funding. So of the universities here, it's it's not been good, because one of one of the the things they thought of recently to try and get more people into science was they were going to reduce um, fees for under like uni students, undergrad uni students here. Yeah. But the universities make their money and run the courses based on the fees. So when the government said no, we're reducing how much you can charge so that you would get more people in they didn't also increase how much funding they'd give for these courses so now all the universities are going to have to reduce the number of scientists they can actually take because they cannot afford to have like say more than like like they have to reduce like the number yeah. of physicists by like say half or so like it's actually going to probably be that many it's like, going to be some worse of these some of the first than it was yeah, we, we could see a reduction in the future. Uh, I, I've had one academic say that they're probably expecting that the universities will lose about 30% of their science staff in the future. And we wonder why we end up with most of our elite scientists not working in Australia and going over to the Europe or to yeah. the US. Well, Australia does really well with science. Like Per capita, we have one of the highest rates of scientific publication, but we have one of the lowest rates of... Um, like actual industrial application from it 
um, the, I mean, part of that is because Australia is quite a small country. We don't have like the funds for startup and like yeah. the ventures that you would in the US or the UK yeah, the, or we the rest used of to Europe. Be, there used to be the push for us to be the clever country, but you've got to go back to the Hawk Keating eras for that. We're going to be the mm. clever country. Well, we stopped being the clever country and we stopped putting the funny, the, the, the finance into science and research and development and that we're cutting back the budget of the CSIRO and we're cutting back other budgets for helping um, companies do research Yeah, and, and that, that was pre-COVID. It's, it's so good. it's it's not, not COVID. It's not no, um, well COVID-related pre, well things. Well, pre-COVID. I it's mean, just, we're talking yeah. changes that happened in the 90s and the uh, early 2000s. I, I, I don't remember a single time in my life where I've heard any significant increase to funding in science. No, in, I don't think we've had it since the Hawke Keating era, to be honest. When yeah. they were talking about the clever country, Australia's got to stop riding on the back of the of the of the sheep and um, become the clever country. We have to invest in in scientific development. We have to invest in research and development. We have to invest we in need our to universities, do it and like, it all fell away. <laughs> it was like it was like yeah. Although one, I have to do, one Labor me, Party said, the, "Yeah, the we're going to do this. We're going to do this." And then it didn't happen. So you kept men- mentioning the Hawke Keating era. Um, for all of the non-Australians in the chat, yeah. they probably they may not be too familiar with with who Bob Hawke was. He was one of our prime ministers. He holds this. This is a prime minister who would go to cricket games and people would pass him pints of beer that he would skull. Yeah, he actually like that, holds that was the, his thing. The record, the Guinness of- World Record for the fastest a liter of beer has ever been chugged. So a former PM, I mean, I've, he died fairly recently yes uh, but he had a good reputation like both like all sides of politics tend to remember i mean him very, I, re- very I, re- I remember because um, i but- saw it when when we won the when um australia 2 won the america's cup and bob Hawke's celebration and then he said um any employer who hires an employee to, who fires an employee tomorrow for not showing up to work is a fucking bastard. And that was his comment <laughs> to the media over the, after this Australia 2 won the America's Cup. <laughs> so, yeah, he so, gave and that was an excuse to take a public holiday. I remember um, when he, he was, got in trouble yeah. for that um, the old guy who stopped him when he was doing his walkthrough and... Um, it had no idea who he was and everything. It just interrupted the entire thing that um, the hockey was doing for this um, this business he was supposed to be walking through. And after they walked away, he goes, that stupid old bastard. <laughs> and of course, the media <laughs> caught that. So it became the headline. Instead of what he was actually doing, the fact that he called this old guy who was clearly a little bit dementia, the stupid old bastard. <laughs> but it was what he, who he was. It, he was just a straight yeah. down the line politician. He was... Uh, quite amazing, he, actually. I, I just, breath, I just breath like breath that Australia, yeah. <laughs> one of Australia's former prime ministers, holds the Guinness World Record for the fastest a leader of beer has ever been sculled. That just <laughs> thinks that says and a lot Paul about Keating's it. Paul Keating's claim to fame was really calling the um, prime minister of Indonesia a uh, recalcitrant, <laughs> which nearly, which um, yeah, nearly caused me a major international inst- incident between Australia and Indonesia. Uh, I think mostly because the um, Indonesian Prime Minister didn't know what a recalcitrant was. <laughs> Neither did most of the press, actually. <laughs> it's not like he was wrong. It probably wasn't the most diplomatic thing to say, but it, it was a good day. It was a good time of politics, but he, but he, to be honest. <laughs> but he was, he did have a reputation for being able to be very good at solving diplomatic problems, didn't he? Like he could sit down with people. Okay. I've Hawk. heard. No, 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 Hawk. Oh, yeah, Hawk um, did. Uh, Keating's problem was he was too blunt with people. I mean, Hawk was blunt, but in a different way. So he he could be he could be everyone's mate. Hawk could, whereas Keating was like, uh, I'm very smart, I'm very quick witted, and I'm going to use my quick wit on you, which doesn't work when you're doing international diplomacy. <laughs> uh, we as Australians look at him and go, "Fuck, that's funny," because uh, I mean, he was if he was the king of tearing down an opposition person if they said something stupid he he was um uh, you know he he was the um Simon Dan of of um the labor party <laughs> no no not really but he he was the man who could te- tear people down you know he would pick out on the little thing that you said wrong and tear you to pieces and that was who he was but he also did it internationally too which was a bad look for a prime when he became prime minister eventually um but yeah, it was an interesting time in Australian politics. 
uh, and it well was also a great. Time, it was a great time for education and um, for research and development because the gov- the Labor government at the time decided just to pour money into Australia. It's like we were coming out of a, a recession in Australia. There was a world. There was a bit of a world recession, but Australia copped it pretty pretty hard because it was all um, primary resource, um, pro- yeah, primary production products that were the problem with the. Um, thing it actually coined the phrase for Australia as a banana republic, um, and unfortunately led Keating to say this was the re- recession we had to have, which is not a good thing to say when you're the party in power. But st- still, um, <laughs> they were being honest. Um, but there was their point. Their point was you couldn't keep riding on primary production. You had to be smarter. You had to work harder. You had to come up with the new ideas, and you had to to push forward and then we had a change of government to a conservative government who just not we're not getting involved with any of this we'll withdraw all the funding and we're not going to do any of this anymore and then we're going to sell off all the assets (laughs) which is what conservatives like to do because apparently short-term gains are more important than long-term ones i would say uh, aside from um the last Labor government, we had the original idea for our national broadband network, which was forward thinking and thinking about the future, but then destroyed by the Liberal Party when they got into power. Um, well, it was, it was the whole rollout for that was terrible. And then the idea was, oh, yes, we're going to put um, fiber optics everywhere, but we're going to have metal, like copper connections between the fiber optic and your house. Which ruins the whole point of having fiber optics everywhere. Yeah. Yeah, so, but but prior to that, the last time we had uh, a forward-thinking government that actually wanted to do something, not just for the term that they were in power, but when they wanted to do something for the future of Australia, you've got to go back to the hawk keating era when they were trying to push for the, uh, the smart Australia, which was Australia's yeah, got that was, better. That was well before my time. And, um, yeah, and, if, and if, if it had carried through, you'd be seeing the benefits of it now matt you'd, you'd have that funding there and we'd be the smarter country but i think we're still yeah. a smart country we're just not a smarter country for it it's it's kind of a shame but um yeah so um we were well, a long time ago we were talking about david Curley. um but as a science communicator as somebody who who uh, took on the issues for climate change uh be, be it ozone depletion um the El Nino, um, climate change as a whole, uh, the, the, the representation he gave to Australia, I mean, he contributed to the 2007 Nobel Peace Prize, which was won by the IPCC and Al Gore, unfortunately. But um, <laughs> but he was, a contri- mm. he was a contributor to that win of the Nobel Peace Prize, so he was one of the people who was there for it. So uh, you've got to look at it. Um, that he, he is a major player in the world of the science of climate change and um, trying to yeah. help us into a better future and make a better time of it. Yeah, so he, he is someone I would really like to meet. He is somebody we could talk to because he's still alive. <laughs> there are two that we've actually discussed on this list um, who are still alive. Uh, the first one was um, Elizabeth Blackburn, and I'd love to talk to her about telomeres. And uh, David Curley is still alive, of course. So these are two people that hopefully one day Matt and I might get to actually talk to. <laughs> All right, guys, you got to, you got to share this video. We got yeah, to get, share this video. Get more share this video. Get it out there. Get get us known because these are people we'd love to have on. We'd love to have have a talk with. We I have actually reached out to another person who's not on our list who actually um, yeah did not a Nobel Prize, but she um, won Australian of the Year. Um, for science um, a few years back and I won't mention her name because I haven't confirmed that she'll be on yet but um, I have actually reached out to her so hopefully Matt and I will get the chance to have a talk to her in the future but it, there's other people within Australia who've done amazing things for the, the um, science as a whole and for the planet as a whole um, not all of them good no, Manhattan Project was mm, it depends how you weigh it up whether it was good or bad um, yeah, it's, it's a tough one. It's a it tough one. It definitely advanced our understanding of science. And, definitely. You know, nuclear technology overall, you can argue... I mean, it's like anything. It's like, like any tool. Like a hammer is probably a really good analogy as well. You can use it to do a lot of destruction, but you can also use it for a lot of good. Yeah. And so I guess it's more about how it's used. But the development of the tool itself, 
I think is is probably a, a, it's worthwhile. It's what we used it for. Yeah. And by we, I mean humanity. Not humanity as a whole. So I mean, I've it, had... um, so yeah, coming out the future for Matt and I um, on this show. Uh, I'll just drop that down so we can see <laughs> so Matt and I can see what's going on now instead of looking at the notes um, <laughs> I have it on the side I have noticed I've got a pattern on my face that's just the green screen running today is having issues picking the difference between my face and the green screen, screen. behind me that's right my microphone has been no doing problems. that my microphone things have been doing that I had to do a whole heap of balancing yeah, but... of the green screen of my green screen before this and um, we sort of Matt's was alright to start off with. It's hard to balance during the show, <laughs> unfortunately. Like, you'll notice it depends where I sit. I haven't quite figured it out. Uh, I've tried to keep my lighting up, but it's, yeah. Yeah, I, I think we'll have to have a bit of a play with it next time and try and get it a bit better. Uh, just to oh, just well. to keep the artificial effect that we're in the same room. <laughs> and not on other sides Side of, the, of what is nearly other sides of a continent, continent. we can say. Because yes, Oceania. Pretty much. Um but yeah, um, coming up next week, we've got um, um, Maddie from Science Side Up is going to join us, and we will definitely be talking physics, and we may even talk a bit more about climate change because she's um, knows a fair bit about both. So, <laughs> so that'll be interesting uh, having a talk to Maddie. We've got a few other people who coming up in the next couple of months. Um, unfortunately. For anybody who's in academia, the next couple of months are also a dreadful time of the year, as Matt will know. <laughs> which may... Well, well at least, our lockdown, at least all those ones in lockdown which should be easy to get hold of. <laughs> Hoping so. So, um... So, yeah, we be looking at doing a, a few discussions with a few more people like we did last week with Tessa um, about various topics that interest them and interest us as well. And um, we hope to see you back on the channel and so you can talk to us. Um, please go over and subscribe to my brilliant co-host, Matt, over here. Uh, that way. <laughs> that way. <laughs> uh, his link's down in the description. Um Matt does absolutely brilliant science videos and he's got some really good stuff coming out soon. Um, you can tell us about it, Matt. Oh, yes. I am going. <laughs> I am making, although I'm sure most people in, in our audience have heard this by yes. now, but I am making a video on what alien life in this solar system might look like and where we might find it. So what I've decided on now, because I've, I've got most of the research, I've still got a bit more, I'm probably then it'd be able to finish it tomorrow, has been a is I'm going to do it as like a tour of the solar system, but it'll be... So we'll go looking at what different planets are like and different bodies in the solar system, but we'll be doing it from, or oh, I'll be trying to do it from the point of view of looking for where we might find life and yeah. the sort of chemical reactions we might need for it. I've also for that got um, uh, Randolph Richardson and Kitty the Atheist on, oh, well, uh, both on board to do um, voice recordings for it as well. So you don't just have to, have to listen to me on that one, yep. but that'll, that'll be... That's going to be a big one in the making. That's why I haven't produced a video for a little while because this one's taking a while. But I'm hoping it to be a nice big one. So, when that's out there, we have lots of aliens. And Tess has also been helping with questions from last week. Yeah. Um, and if you haven't seen that stream, go back and watch and it. And Jen, Jen's also been, yeah, I've been uh, sent me a lot of nice stuff for that and is uh, making me some nice animations. Well, I've got a program for making the nice manner animations. I'm not. I'm cheating. <laughs> Uh, I'll own up. I'm cheating. <laughs> but, uh, I was giving you an excuse. You no, said no, you're you doing don't all need these to do that. People see the stuff I do anyway. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so we've got some good stuff coming up in the next couple of weeks, uh, both of us. Um, and we're looking forward to bringing some more science stuff to you. We'll probably um, go into a couple more scientists, maybe maybe some lesser known ones from around the world in, in some future episodes. Um or so just ones who interest us. Just uh, when when we don't have a guest on, it's good good to have a topic we can fall back on, <laughs> for for us to have a talk about. But we might also talk about some new trends in science that are coming out as well. And um, we're always happy to have crazy questions from you lot in the chat. Um, um, they're all talking about green screens now in the chat. <laughs> I I the videos I make I do chroma key and post for for yeah. it um so i yeah 
But I've got... I use DaVinci Resolve to get rid of them, and it's a bit more... It's actually really... I, I do like it. It's very powerful for the free software. It's yeah. Like no watermarks, no ads, and you get a program that rivals um, the Adobe, Adobe um, Premiere. Uh, Premiere, that's it. So, like, the Premiere Pro. So, yeah. So, um, thank you, everybody in the chat, for joining us. This has been um, a lot of fun for the two of us. Um, and like I said, next week we've got Maddie from Science Side Up on. Um, that should be a lot of fun too. I don't know what we're talking about yet. I'm going to give her some options there because that way we're covering stuff that she's interested in because I know that she's qualified in quite a few things. So it's one of those things. Um, she'll pro she, She's a professional. She'll probably um, lead the show in her own dynamic way. <laughs> Um, and like I said, we've got a few other get big guests coming on later on as well, um, including at some point we'll probably have Dr. Carl on, um, just because we can, <laughs> and because he's amazing. Um, <laughs> and we both like That's talking sweet. to him. <laughs> yes, we have both done that uh, both on done a few that, occasions yes. before. <laughs> well, you more so than me, but you work with him, so, well, work in the same building as him. <laughs> Yeah, he hasn't been in since lockdown started, but uh, yeah, he's on his office, the floor below mine. Yeah. Um, so there's bragging. <laughs> but yeah, we've got other people we've got coming in. So we over the next um, couple of months, we've got... Um, uh, ooh. I, I won't mention names, but we've got um, a particle physicist, um, an uh, astrophysicist, an astronomer... Uh, we've going, we will be having Mero on at some point it could, instead, because she couldn't make tonight. We will actually be having her on, and I'm sure her and Matt will geek out about chemistry because it's a great opportunity to talk chemistry. Um, we are looking to have Scientist Mel on at some point as well. I'm happy to talk about people you guys know in the community because you'd be expecting that we have them on at some point. Um, we uh, Conspiracy Cats will be on um in sometime in September. He's not available for next month, but he'll be on sometime in September uh, to come and talk to us. Uh, we've got we've got a topic in mind for that one, so that'll be um, interesting. Like I said, we, we've got a few people booked out that, um, <laughs> to, to come on the show over the next couple of months, so it, it should be a lot of fun. So please, if you're not subscribed, subscribe. Um, click the bell so you know when Matt and I are doing these. Um, I will link them in Twitter as will Matt. Um, and follow us both on Twitter and make sure that you're watching our videos because we love doing this stuff. And, um, yeah, I don't know. Anything to add, Matt? <laughs> no, I think you've all said, you've said it all very brilliantly. Yeah. So, I so, guess, until next time, everyone. Yep. Go on, say it, Matt. Uh, are you doing mine or what Do you yours. normally have at the Do end yours. of your shows? No. Oh, I was going to say, yes, until next time, everybody, be like protons and stay positive. Bye. <laughs> it's better than choking on a selfie stick, I think. It is, it is. <laughs> well, not. <laughs>